<sighs> Hello. Now, I'm sorry, the light is shining and off everything, but that's because I have to have the windows open. Because there's a certain song with me who likes to look out on them, so if I put the curtains over them, they then complain. So the joys of the corner office effect are in um, full accordance in this uh, current video. Oh well. I'm, I'm, I'm told that their reassurance and presence more than makes up for this. Today's topics, and what will be the topic for a whole series of these videos, will be Dreadnoughts from Around the World, 1905 to 1914. Now, I have been working on this since Tuesday the 20th of April, and as such, that's the date position down below. But, quite a lot has been added in since then. I'm not sure if you should be trying to lick the varnish off the table. Okay. Um, lick me instead. Good boy. You lick my hand. And this all started with the first discussions going through about battle cruisers and dreadnoughts and Jutland and other things. In that, it's not just the classes which have to be seen. In my, when I'm teaching this, I always try and stress that you have to look at the whole. That every class, every ship that's being built reflects what's going on around it at the time. Both the geostrategic, uh, you know, things going on and the technological things going on and the cultural things going on. So, fleets of the world in 1905. Well, what's happened? Well, there has been the Battle of Tashima, where a lot of ships were pummeled at long range. And Admiral Togo managed to. Well, basically cross and recross the T of the Russian fleet. Now, we can be honest, uh, the poor forces that are sent by the Russians were at the end of a mammoth long journey. None of their ships were in condition to fight, and frankly, it was down to honour and bravery on their part that they managed to do even what they did accomplish in that particular battle. But there are a lot of things coming together at the same time. There are turbines, there is improvements in armour, there is improvements in high explosive, there are improvements in radio control, and there are improvements in salvo director control. All coming through at the point at this point. I there is no point having an all big gun battleship if you can't actually hit anything at the range of those guns. There is no point in them. Because all that happens is you're going to keep missing the enemy while they're at long range, isn't that correct? And then they'll get closer with their slightly shorter range guns, but that fire a lot faster than your longer range guns, and will pummel you to pieces. Yes. This is, after all, why the Royal Navy starts focusing on the six-inch battleship, uh, six-inch cruiser and light cruiser in the interwar period. Uh, it sits there and goes, well, we're building eight-inch cruisers because everyone else has them, but do they really make sense? And, of course, free radar, the engagement range of an eight-inch and a six-inch is near enough as makes no difference. So... Well, the 6-inch will pummel the enemy, and a lot more shells will be fired at the enemy, which gives you a lot more chances of hitting them. I Yes, if a single 8-inch shell hits, it's going to cause more damage. But if you're firing three or four times the rate of fire, uh, number of shells with 6-inch than you are with 8-inch, well, you're likely to get, even if it's the same percentage of hits, three or four times more hits. And... Let's be honest, three or four six-inch shells are going to do more damage than a single eight-inch shell, because, yes, your armor might be able to resist the first impact of a six-inch shell. Might be able to resist the first impact of an eight-inch shell. Will it resist the second in a close enough area? Will it resist the third? The fourth? 
this is the point when you're talking about gun when you're picking your guns. This is also why, despite them having 13, 14, 15, and 16 and 18 inch guns in service at the time when Drenord is built, they go for 12 inch. Because it's balancing range and speed of fire and accuracy to get the best performance characteristics. So, here is what's a dominant battleship type in 1905, before Dreadnought. We call them the pre-Dreadnoughts, but really we shouldn't. Before these, they're called the Ironclad Battle... There are the Ironclad Battleships. And uh, ever since Dreadnought came into existence, it's become pre-Dreadnought. But I don't think these should be called pre-Dreadnoughts. I think they should just be called battleships. Because, to me, if you ask any child to draw a battleship, it will come out looking like this, with guns all over the place, of various calibers, well, usually squiggly lines, pointing in all sorts of directions. You have the Mikasa, which is, of course... A lovely Japanese example. Very nicely designed here. And you have Atrimus Agamemnon. One of the last British designs of, as I say, officially called pre-dreadnoughts. But that seems rather cruel because, let's be honest, when they were being built pre-HMS Dreadnought, do you think anyone called them pre-dreadnoughts? No. The thing is, though, they hang around in service, hang hang around in service for a long time. So this is why pre-dreadnought starts to catch on as a type of battleship, because they're hanging around in the time of the dreadnoughts. But some of these are actually completed after the dreadnoughts are. Something we'll be getting into as this uh, this video goes on. Now, before we get into too much. There are going to be some key people I'm going to talk quickly mention. And in a nicest way, we will always get, thanks to his very nice article in 1903, a focus on Cuniberti and his ideas. He's lovely, but honestly, his friend Benedito Brin could have also written that article. But he didn't. So he's forgotten. And it's not just the Italians who are looking at this. Yes, they codify into an article first. But the British have been looking at it, the Japanese have been looking at it, and the Americans have all been looking at it just as much. Jackie Fisher, mentioned here, has been looking at these things since before he was CNC Mediterranean Fleet. He's been talking about all big gun ships. Um... Pakenham's report on Admiral Togo Hayashiro, Admiral Togo Hayashiro's, um battle, the Battle of Tsushima. Well, that has an impact on British design. And there's Charles Algernon Parsons, who comes up with a steam turbine. These are all things which are going to filter in, because, let's be honest, a Dreadnought is not just the first big gun battleship. You know, in, in fact, this is the idea taken from Wikipedia, because it was the best graphic I could find for it, of... Vittorio Comerti's ideal, which gives you eight guns able to focus on any target coming at you from any angle, but honestly looks like some form of pre dreadnought, more like a upper up gun pre dreadnought than it does a dreadnought. Yes, it's an all big gun ship, but doesn't really look like a dreadnought, which looks in comparison like. Well, honestly, someone's taken a destroyer and not done, but... Where is this difference coming from? Where is the difference in hull? Where is the difference in stylings coming from? Well, they come from 
what the Dreadnought is built to do. The Dreadnought is built with steam turbines. The Dreadnought is built, therefore, to be fast. There's also the fact that what does the Royal Navy need from it? This matters. Because what does an Italian sort of, uh, Italian fleet need? Well, an all big gun ship like Canaberti's design would be great for the Italians. Doesn't need to be as long ranged or potentially as fast at this point. Because who is it being built against? The Austrians and the French. Yeah. They're not exactly a long way away from Italy. And they're going to be duking it out of the Mediterranean. And frankly, as much as we would love to believe that they would build the best ship they possibly could build, you're going to save money where you can. You're going to build the best ship you can do for your country. And for Italy, it wouldn't have looked like, at this point, HMS Dreadnought if they had been the first to build an all-big gun ship. And there's a reason they don't get there first. <laughs> because honestly, they're looking at it going, uh, Director Far, uh, well, we're going to be facing these ships, these ships. Is it sensible to have an all-big gun ship when we're likely to be dealing with fast-moving destroyers or torpedo boats coming in at close ranges in the operating environment in the Mediterranean? You can understand them going, mm hmm Whereas for the British going, well, it's looking more and more like it's the Germans, possibly the Americans. So let's see, we'll be fighting in the North Sea or the North Atlantic or the Pacific or the Indian Ocean. Let's be honest, the odds of us facing a German fleet in the Mediterranean or an American fleet in the Mediterranean is fairly low. We'll need a capability in that area, but you know. Suddenly you go, well, we need sea keeping. That design's not going to be great for sea keeping. It's going to be very heavy and wet. I know. There's a pussycat up here. Okay. You go tell the pussycat off. Thank you for making my armrest quite so damp. It's going to be a different scenario. Dreadnought is the uh, the all big gun ship built for the Royal Navy. It does need to be fast. Why? Britain has a lot of sea area to protect, and it wants to speed. It, it's going to be powered by 18 Babcock and Wilcox boilers, supplying two sets of steam turbines, generating 23,000 shaft horsepower. These are deployed over four shafts for a top speed of 21 knots. Again, a four shaft design. Other nations will save expense and weight by going for three shafts. Britain goes for four shafts. Why? Because it's important this ship can keep moving. I, if you get a shaft damaged or you get an engine damaged, you can keep going. No, you are not hunting down the cats in the garden. She's armed with 10 12-inch guns in five twin turrets. Now, theoretically, three of those turrets are positioned to fire forward, so she can fire, have six firing forward. But honestly, you do not want to fire the inner guns on those wing turrets when you're firing forward. So, re realistically, she's got four guns firing forward. The same if they're firing aft, so, you know, it's four aft. However, she has a broadside of eight, and as the experience in Toshima had shown, if you cross the enemy's T, that is the best thing. So, the reason it doesn't worry the British to have her like that is because, well, they have... They've given her steam turbines. They've given her a speed of 21 knots. How do you cross the enemy's T? You'd be faster than them, so you can get ahead and go... You don't want to blast away alongside each other. You want to get ahead. And that's what the British are talking about. And that is why 
Dreadnought looks the way she is and why Dreadnought is the way she is. So I have great respect for Kunabati. He's the first person to really codify in a public setting the concept of a big gun ship. But the point about the Dreadnought is it's not just a big gun ship. It's more than that. It's got turbines. It's got torpedo tubes, although that's not unusual. It's got all sorts of things put into it to try and make it the best and battleship it can be for Britain. The trouble is, Britain is the leading nation in the world this time when it comes to warships, when it comes to naval power, so immediately everyone sets and goes, that must be the best, so we must compete with that. Which is fine. Because in 1905, here is the reality. Yes, the Royal Navy has 11 other battleships in the service. Has... I think it's two pre-dreadnoughts under construction. Has... 39 pre-dreadnoughts in service. A dreadnought in the construction, and no, of course, dreadnoughts in service. You go through that list. No one else is really looking that great. And admittedly, that is Russia post the Russo-Japanese War. But again, the Royal Navy can afford to start mucking around. If Dreadnought had turned out to be a failure, if they had taken all the salvo of firing, all the ideas of Percy Scott, which I'll be getting into in subsequent videos, all those sort of things, and gone, put it all together, it didn't work. Well, A, Britain had two pre-Dreadnought designed standard battleships in production, the best design of those they could build. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's a ship, which would be lovely if it works, but if it doesn't work, the British are not exactly going to be exposing themselves. So there are lots of arguments and debates over whether or not Britain should have built Dreadnought when it did, whether it should have done these sort of things when it did. Arguably at that point, Britain was the most secure it was, and when countries are secure, they have two options. They either rest on their laurels, and hope that whatever they've got in the back cave of development they can actually implement quickly enough that they can actually build it and it will work or they can build something and see where it works and if it didn't work would the royal navy in the nicest way the royal navy had had lots of ships which hadn't worked and they'd still been the royal navy we're talking about a nation which had tried various forms of ironclad and <sighs> some really interesting designs of battleships and uh, vessels. The captain springs to mind. And they'd still been the Royal Navy. No one had questioned them. So maybe Parliament questioned them, but not too loudly and not too publicly. It would look unpatriotic. And by the way, uh, I thought I should explain the other battleship category. Basically, if you're a Royal Sovereign class, um, uh, Centurion class, or HMS Renown, you're all kind of not included in the pre-Dreadnought category. Even though technically you are pre-Dreadnoughts, just the... the Battleships just keep evolving. And the same if you are the Texas, which was going around at this point, which is a central gun type. Oh. Fun. So. They're still in service, though. This is the point. They will be in service for a long time. 
Britain will have pre-dreadnoughts and dreadnoughts in service in large numbers for a long time. This is not unusual. Honestly, when HMS Dreadnought was in the world, that's great. She is a top of the line, brand new, old big gunship. Would you want to take on an entire squadron of pre dreadnoughts solo? Depends how fast they could uh, they could power through the water. But honestly, it is it's a different world than what we have today. Today, when we talk about ships and we talk about the latest and greatest coming in, immediately you're talking about decommissioning the previous ships. Oh, that's terrible. That's old hat. But that's not the case. To keep costs down, one of the things you tr try to do, and navies and governments try to do, is to keep a constant flow of orders running through shipyards. And it would then be wasteful to have had those ships, and they're pre otherwise new ships, and just get rid of them. That would be a waste of taxpayers' money. Especially when they are still useful. What we get today is a lot of well, splurge, surge, and then nothing. Government splurges money. There's a surge in production, and then it disappears. It's splurge and surge, and then they're going off and researching and researching and developing and spending all that money in random developments, which may or may not work, and we don't really know if they're going to work till we build a ship. Whereas in this period, it's a common thing, and all governments are doing this, and this is one of the reasons why, again, you're going to notice. There is not a rapid, immediate adoption of dreadnought design construction and transferring to dreadnought construction by other nations. They watch the British, but they're still building their pre-dreadnoughts. Why? They're still useful. And until you understand the full ramifications of this, there is no point diving in. So that's why these ships are still around, because, no, they actually, did. let's be honest, Texas had no use, at all no use by this point. She had a very uh, story career, she'd been incredibly useful when she was in, uh, built, and, you know, during her early career, but by 1905, really? Why? Um, as for the Royal Sovereigns... I love them. They have great seagoing capabilities, but honestly, by this point, someone should have done something about the uh, about them. All right. So what have we got coming up? Well, you're going to have three of these videos come out today. Uh, the votes and decisions for the 13th of May and 20th of May are going to be decided by. Sunday. And next week we have Adfab's Coastal Command in the 1920s and 1930s. And Monitors of the Royal Navy Section 3 is finally going to come out. Mainly because I've had to redo a lot of that. But it should be good. And this, there are going to be three of these years come out today. There's going to be 1905, 1906, 1907. And 1908, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and possibly, if I'm being generous, 15, will all come out during my research trip. So they'll be coming out one a day during my research trip to basically say, you know, thank you.
for better putting up with me disappearing on a research trip. <laughs> I have to do them occasionally. Joys of academia. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed 1905, and thank you. And if you like the videos, please do like them. Maybe subscribe. Press that. Maybe press the little bell down there. Come join on Discord for a chat, or if you're feeling very generous and want to feed my book habit and my research expenses, because that's very kindly what actually is some of the money is going on, um, then please consider Patreon. There is some merchandise in Patreon now as well, set up for certain tiers, and I'm hoping it works. And I am working on other merchandise which should be available soon. And books should be out soon as well. Okay.